Doug Verone has applied his considerable talent to projects in theater, opera, film, and fashion, but he's most famous for being one of New York City's finest modern dance choreographers. His eight-member troupe, Doug Verone and Dancers, is the resident company at New York's famous 92nd Street Y. Previews editor John Mark Raffis speaks with Verone about the characteristics of his choreography. The former dancer also discusses the three works, Karugi, Boats Leaving, and Lux, on the program for his company's Penn State debut. You certainly, your company is certainly, in, in it's um, going on 26 years, been a fixture in New York City. You're the resident company at the 92nd Street Y, and, and so your credentials are outstanding. But since you're new to Penn State, why don't you tell me a little bit about your company? What makes the work so um, uh, potent for audiences is that it um, it has an accessibility to it that... Uh, that doesn't um, belie the integrity of the art. So I try to create dances uh, from uh, a place that's very true within myself and true within the collaborators that I work in and work with and place that uh, forward as honestly as possible so that when an audience member sees it, they can relate to it and see aspects of themselves within it. But um, uh, it challenges them as well to... um, uh, try to define uh, or or uh, create worlds for themselves to understand the dances in. So it, it, it feels as if it's a beautiful give and take between uh, the art that's on stage and uh, the audience member. I think that um, the humanity of the work also um, uh, has been a, a defining point for us, that I, I create dances about people. Uh, and I create dances about situations and dances about relationships and, um, and the day-to-day aspects of what we go through in our lives. And sometimes those dances can be very minimal. Uh, they can be about gestures. Uh, they can be about stillness, the things that we, uh, we cherish in life in, in human form. Uh, I look at the body language of people uh, all around uh, on the street and try to remember that when I go into the studio so that I can access real um, uh, ideas and place them into the body of my work. That said, they can also be enormously physical with a dance language that is incredibly explosive. So uh, the dancers live in two completely different worlds, and I think actually the program that we're bringing to Penn State really um, accentuates that. The centerpiece of the Penn State program is your new dance, Karuji. It's set to an oratorio by Mozart. I see in the description that it explores themes like heroism, duplicity, and myth-making. Those sound like big themes. Yes, uh, and, and, and yet small ones. I think we see them every, in everyday life. Um, uh, and once again, uh, taking uh, the Mozart, uh, it is actually it's a, it's an oratorio entitled uh, uh, Liberata Betulia. And um, it, is, uh, it, it was an oratorio that he wrote when he was 15 years old. Um, and it's very, very rarely performed, which I love, because there's no expectations about um, uh, what to see and what to think. So it's a really allowed my imagination to go in, tear the libretto apart, and present it in a new way that feels purely contemporary. Uh, the story of the, of, of the oratory is uh, about Judith from the Bible. And I, I was not interested in creating a dance about Judith, but I loved, uh, as you said, the, the themes that pop out that I think we embrace in everyday life. Um, you know, they, they, they situate themselves around how we relate to each other uh, as human beings. And that, for me, was the crux, taking a look at the libretto um, and uh, shifting my imagination to create dances and create community based upon uh, a new idea of them. It, uh, you know, the, the word Karuji and, and the inspiration for it, you know, comes from um, kind of the dark alleyways that, that um, are in the medieval towns in Italy, uh, Genoa in particular, and also on the hillsides. They were pathways that connected communities. And I love the idea that um, something architectural can be built from that. Uh, whether it's through light, whether it's through um, uh, one particular projection that constantly changes and shifts, but something that supports 
uh, the visual uh, and the emotional journey of this community is uh, is is something that I'm 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 headed after. The other two dances are both from 2006. That's correct. Um, one of them is called Boats Leaving, which I've read in more than one place is described as as one of your masterpieces. So that must make you feel good. That makes me feel pretty okay. <laughs> It sounds like an amazing work. Tell me about Boats Leaving. Well, I think I think that Boats Leaving is one of those um, one of those defining works that uh, you hope you create every so often in your career, um, and it was just the perfect mix of process and and dance company uh, and score and idea, and it just it, it simmered and it and it moved forward. Um, just at the right time uh, in my creative uh, life. Uh, it's a work set to an Arvo part to Deum. It's a choral work. And um, it, it came out of the need for me uh, to create in a completely different way. I, um, uh, I, I felt as if uh, after having created for so many years that my process of creating uh, in the studio was getting stale and that uh, the, the tenure of my work was beginning to feel the same way. And rather than step into the studio and create another work that felt the same way, I needed to find a new way to make a dance. So I sat down on a chair. I had the New York Times with me, which I had just finished reading, and I opened up the front page. And there was a photograph of soldiers um, getting ready to vote in Iraq for the first time. And I just said, you know what, let's, um, let's just make this photograph. So I arranged the eight dancers in my company to be the eight Iraqi soldiers right in front of me, and there was a visual. And I moved to the second page, and there was another photograph, and we created that. And by the end of three days, I had made about 60 to 80 photographs in visual form using the dancers. And they were complete, um, uh, from complete uh, disparate universes. Uh, some were about uh, world politics. Others were sports. Some were arts. Some were advertisements. Anything that compelled me to make uh, uh, the photograph reality, uh, whether it was emotional content or the architectural content, I did. So uh, here I had a series of these photographs in live form in front of me. And all I did was have them move from place to place. One photograph into the next photograph, into the next photograph. And a story started slowly being told. And it wasn't about the photographs, but it was about this organism and this beautiful sense of, um, of community that was moving through time. The title seems to imply loss. Is that, is that a fair assessment or is that... I do believe that is a fair assessment, yes. It is definitely about departure, uh, and everyone has a very different um, uh, sense of what that is to themselves. And in that regard, I think Boats Leaving has, has, has been uh, embraced uh, by many people because I think it means many things. Uh, it's been built in, in a universal way that um, the sense of loss um, becomes very personal for each individual that sees it. Arvo Part is a an Estonian composer and a, a pretty famous one. I'm I'm fairly certain we've had a couple of his works on I'm programs sure here in the last have, few years. Yes. Um, what what is this particular music like? What does it sound like? Well, it is a it, it's a choral work. It's a religious work. Um, so it it has a um, uh, it it has a depth to it and has a weight to it and it has a beauty to it. It also soars. Um, it, it, it builds to intense, intense um, choral sounds, and then it drops off into the quietest, um, still um, echo of an idea. If Boats Leaving is perhaps reflective, um, the third piece, Lux, sounds like it is um, celebratory. It absolutely is. It's, a, it's an incredibly optimistic work, and I, I consider it the twin to uh, boats leaving. They were built within six months of each other. Uh, and so they, they have lived side by side in our repertory for many, many years. And they, in many ways, they are the flip side of each other. Um, uh, I wanted to create, after having created boats, which um, uh, deals with loss, I wanted to create a work uh, that celebrated life. 
and um, boats. Uh, I'm sorry, Lux very much does that within the context of the Philip Glass score and the soaring qualities of the dancing um, that uh, that takes place on stage. Visually, it sounds interesting. Uh, the the uh, the Philip Glass music uh, to which the dance is set is called the Light, mm-hmm. and um, I understand that there's a moon rising um, in the background, which yes, sounds like a, a very simple but very powerful image. It's a beautiful image. Uh, uh, Robert Woodsell's lighting is is really quite stunning. Very simple, uh, very evocative, but um, you know the moon. You, the thing that's beautiful about the moon is it starts very low. And then you, you sort of forget about it, and then all of a sudden, at the end of the dance, it's 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 risen to the top, and then the work is over. Uh, so you feel as if uh, time has passed, but you you've not really recognized it within the course of the dance. Tickets are on sale for Doug Verone and Dancers, October nineteenth, twenty twelve, at Penn State's Eisenhower Auditorium. Order online at www.cpa.psu.edu or by phone at one eight hundred. Arts T-I-X.